Okay, remember that I was saying that um, what happens now when you have a format given, as you do in the assignment memo in this PT, is that you do all your work and all your thinking and reasoning on your three issue sheets, and then you look at what the format says, you know, fill in this information in this question, fill in this information in this question, fill in this information in this question. So the format becomes the structure for you to uh, uh, organize the information that you give to the grader. But the issues and the reasoning is done in isolation, issue by issue, so that it's simpler for you to stay clear about what issue, you know, what the reasoning is for each issue. So in this performance test, the assignment memo gave you a very clear format, which was very, very much just sort of a helper document for you to think this problem through, honestly. Okay, here's the beginning of the format. This is part A of the format, or part one, I guess it was. Okay, ethical slash fiduciary issues. And it had four questions, A, B, C, and D. This is right in the assignment memo of this performance test, so you can follow along if you want to. Okay. So the first question is, did C act, uh, did, did C uh, become the escrow agent for all parties? And the answer is, yes, he did. That by not returning the trust property when he received it from um, Virch's attorney, he implicitly undertook to be the escrow agent for all parties. Actually, in our performance test, Beyond implicitly, the first letter that um, Chris Connors wrote on February 16th, he actually says, okay, guys, everybody send this stuff to me. I'll hold it, arrange for everybody to sign it. So he actually explicitly became an escrow agent as well, even though he didn't realize the significance of what he was doing. So basically, the, um, the first case um, where uh, it described um, what an escrow holder is. The Wassman case um, it, it is the answer to these questions. Okay, so the second question is, if he did become an escrow agent, was it proper for him to still be an attorney for one party? And the answer to that is, Yes, actually in the Wassman case, the facts of the, of the case were that it was a divorce and it was a property settlement and a divorce and the um, attorney was an attorney for representing one of the parties to the divorce. So it is possible to the client, the attorney has fiduciary duties, but as the escrow holder, he has a duty um, to strictly obey the escrow instructions for all parties. It is possible for him to do both duties at once. Okay, so that's the situation. Yes, he can still represent one party, but he can't. He can't favor his party um, um, in his role as escrow holder. C. That might have been going to C. Let's see. C says if he's acting in a dual capacity, um, does that restrict? Here it is. Does that restrict his ability to advise his client? and to follow the escrow instructions. And so these are the two sources of duties. On the one hand, to have a duty of loyalty to his client, to put his client's interests uppermost, that's what an attorney's supposed to do, and yet on the other hand, to follow the escrow instructions. So d is he restricted? Yes, he's restricted. Because where it comes to the escrow property, his duty as an escrow holder is paramount. Because if he fails to do it, as we're going to find out in the options for uh, number two, he's liable under tort liability. D says, is, uh, if, an escrow, uh, if he is an escrow holder, what are his duties to the other party? His duties are to the other party are to um, strictly obey joint escrow instructions. That's, that's the bottom line. So really all four of these questions break apart what you learned from the Wassman, well, the statutes on uh, um, um, what an escrow, just defining escrow and, what an, and um, um, also in the Wassman case, 
these issues really all come, questions are all answered um, with reference to the Wassman case. The rest of the format was the options. Again, this is right in your assignment memo. So part two of the format was the options for what um, actions Chris Connor, our client, could take. Okay. So the first option is that he transfer the stock to his clients. Well, that's the one thing he absolutely cannot do. If he does that, he has exercised dominion over the property. Okay. He's liable in conversion because he altered the 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 um, the agreement uh, by altering the uh, payment schedule. Okay, he has um, acted in conscious disregard of the other party to the uh, escrow, and thus he would also be liable for punitive damages. So, con ignoring the fact that there's a problem between the two parties uh, right now, a dispute over the uh, the escrow is, um, uh, and, and going ahead and completing the deal anyway, is absolutely not recommended. Um, by the way, one of the things that the second case, the Diaz case, says is that while it's true that the absolute duty is to follow joint escrow instructions, um, if one party tries to say, hey, change the escrow instructions, you know, do this instead, there is no duty to follow what one party um, uh, says. Um, it has to be the joint escrow instructions. And so I suppose part of your reasoning here could be, well, um, you know, it's just Verta, uh, Verta's attorney, who's now saying, you know, I want to back out of this deal, return the shares of stock to me. But that's not the full extent of the, uh, um, of the situation because our client is aware that there's now a breakdown in the deal between the two parties. And furthermore, he's aware that he has altered the meaning, the, the, substantially the meaning of the documents that were uh, placed in escrow with him. So um, it, it can't be solved by saying, oh, that's just one side telling me to do something and I don't have to obey what one side says. Okay, the second option is to file an interpleader. Again, that's putting the property before the court, serving all sides, allowing the court to decide. That's a really good decision, okay, because it washes the escrow holder's hands of any further involvement in the deal or any liability for what happens beyond that point, okay. Given the fact that he has acted entirely unethically by changing the terms of the deal, by changing the, the the wording of the document, and giving them two different things to sign and pretending that they'd signed the same thing, his, his safest course of action is definitely to file an interpleader. Okay. So this is highly recommended. The Diaz case gave as an alternative to that though, um, just holding the property and letting the sides, you know, uh, see if they can reach an agreement. That's still a kosher course of action according to Diaz. So the third option given in the format is do nothing and permit the parties to negotiate a settlement. That's okay. Um, under normal circumstances, that would probably be preferable in this circumstance to allow them to work out. But given the fact that, that Chris has already acted tortiously, okay, in this circumstance, um, it's probably not a good idea to have the Verta's attorney gunning for him, threatening to sue him for conversion, okay, and ordering him to return the stocks and not to comply with that, given the fact that he knows, well, he will know as soon as he reads our memo, um, that he, he really is already liable for, uh, for tortious behavior. So, Although that would normally be an okay course of action, given what Chris has already done, it's not, uh, it's not as good uh, an option as filing an interpleader. And that's this PT.